Hello everyone and welcome to the Searcher Cast by Greenville Ghost Tours. My name is Dustin Bays and I'm the director of Truth Searchers Paranormal Investigators and I will be your host alongside Gabe Matthews, certified paranormal investigator and founder of Truth Searchers Paranormal Investigators. Join Gabe, myself, and our guests as we share paranormal experiences, media, and current events. What evidence will the Truth Searchers find this time? It's uh, Gabe Matthews, Dustin Bays here with the Searcher cast. We are back and we have a special guest tonight. We'll get to that a little later, but D Dustin, how are you feeling today? today? How are you feeling? What's going on, Gabe? What's going on, Searchers? Yeah, I'm doing really good today. You know, we we went on a little field trip this morning. We got the Searcher Mobile out of the shop. Has it has it made it to the I, end of the it, day? It, it, it drove still, home with no issues. Running? So I, I feel like the dark passenger that was has infiltrated the vehicle is hopefully gone. Hopefully forever. Yeah, yeah. You know, you we were talking about like doing some sort of video where we introduced the searcher mobile um maybe maybe within that uh we should also do some sort of ritual uh cleansing of the searcher mobile uh to make sure that uh truly dark passengers definitely have, have i mean gone. i've already done a couple ritual smudgings of it and hopefully it's 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 vanished but that, that definitely will be a part of of the video that's for sure you know apart from apart from being excited about getting the searcher mobile back out of the shop i'm also excited i have a i have a trip yeah you were telling up, me about that you know and yeah yeah and actually i, I think it could be a, a good segue to our guests because i'm going to be traveling i'm going to be traveling a bit i'm going down to florida i'm going through saint augustine which we talked about saying on because we talked about the hot sauce and so you know i'm going to be stopping through maybe looking for some ghost tours to try and check out because if we haven't mentioned already if you haven't heard this is a searcher cast sponsored by greenville ghost tours the the tour company that both you and i work for and uh, you mentioned something about you're going to do some investigation down in florida Oh, yes, yes, yes. So we were talking about earlier, I, I came across a video of the spinning fish. And so the spinning fish, if you haven't heard of spinning fish, there is out of the keys, specifically in the Big Pine area, Kajo Key area, and it, it started to spread out, but they're getting reports of fish more often at night, but also found during the day. They're just kind of spinning around in the water, disoriented until they're ultimately dying. And there's an endangered species of short tooth sawfish that is being affected it, it's a part of the ray it's kind of skates family the sawfish sometimes thought to be a shark but actually a ray part of the ray family that spinning can't be explained through science which is basically the definition of a paranormal event is you know beyond the scope of scientific understanding absolutely and i do a lot of paranormal investigation with fish and this might be something you know when you go down and get thing we can send it i i had an ichthyologist that i used to email but they haven't responded to me in quite a while uh, so hopefully we can get some input from them. Uh, if not, um, you know, maybe we can reach out to any ichthyologists out there because we could uh, use a, a, a one that's a little more responsive uh, to us. So open call out there. Any ichthyologists listening to this or anyone who knows one, get in touch with us. We'd love to have you on the podcast. We'd love to help, you know, have you be part of some of the paranormal research I do because I, I, we do some with fish uh, using some Karelian photography and photographic plates and whatnot. And, you know, with the data, it's good to get a scientific uh, mind to kind of look at it. Oh, I, w I was going to say they have tested the water pretty extensively. They have not found any abnormalities in the water. They have not found any algae blooms. Uh, there's no algae blooms in the area that can be accredited to this behavior, which sometimes algae blooms can cause neurological issues in, in wildlife. So I'd also be interested in temperature fluctuations, pH changes, as well as mercury content, as well as other, you know, salts and, and whatnot that's in the water pollution pollutants. But yeah, very interesting to say the least. But without further ado, we do want to introduce our guest. Our guest is Sam. Sam came on the Greenville Ghost Tour, which I uh, gave a guide. And I talked to her, and she has been to over 70-plus ghost tours and haunted attractions throughout, I guess, the world, I would say. Probably mostly in the U.S., but uh, probably went to some that are outside of the U.S., I, I imagine. And she also works at Netherworld, which is the premier haunted attraction in the south, I would say, or in, 
in the United States. Welcome to the podcast, Sam. <laughs> Thanks. I'm excited to be here. So yeah, funny that you mentioned about St. Augustine too, because that was actually my first ever ghost tour and still one of my favorites. So highly suggest going to one of there. But yeah, so I work at Netherworld. I'm definitely one of the lower level people. I think half the time they forget I exist, but it's something that's a lot of fun. Getting to scare people as a job is just kind of a dream come true because you get some great stories out of it. One of my favorite all time stories was there was this one guy coming in and he was a big buff dude and he was carrying these two girls behind him. And then the whole time he was fussing in the haunt going, oh, I don't even know why y'all are so scared. Like this ain't even scary. So of course I'm like, dude, you're going down. So I'm in this swamp room and there's these lasers on top of me and I've got these clippers on. So like with our clippers, you can jump out at somebody, clip in front of them, and it makes a noise with them. Waited till he was almost out of the room, jumped up, and I probably almost smacked him in the face, but went in with the clippers. He jumped back. The girls behind them were like, oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, so glad somebody got him. He was like, yeah, dude, you got me. That was good. And I'm like, oh, I wish I could show you I'm some little short five three girl that's like half your size right now so you know you get a lot of cool stories like that now you said when you say swamp room for those of us who don't know what is what is this is a swamp room like is this a room decorated to look like a swamp yeah so the room itself you've got like these big blow up things so it feels like you're trekking through something and then there's lasers in the room that make it look like water so i was like the swamp creature in it But, you know, that's one of the creatures that we do. And we kind of do a whole lot of different characters. You know, we've got backstories to some of them. We always get our makeup up. Yeah, definitely share a picture of uh, what you look like in makeup. And you mentioned you you play characters. What character do you play or characters? So my main character for the past two or three years has been Candy. Um, She is a nurse. And there's a couple other people that I really play off of whenever I'm playing her. Um, So let me get these pictures up. All right, so this is one of my looks. She's Candy. She's very much a Harley Quinn kind of character. Me and another girl, we work a five minute escape room on set. So basically they can pay extra, go in for a five minute escape room. It's this creepy scientist kind of thing. And my friend who I play against, she actually drew this comic strip and basically we both have feelings for the mad scientist he doesn't give a crap about either one of us but there's this whole soap opera drama where we're trying to murder each other so we can have the scientist all to ourselves so we'll be out in the middle of the lot screaming at each other and you know slap fighting and all that kind of stuff and that's part of our haunt character is that you know we want to be the one to help him kill all these people and it's just us so it's a character that we have a lot of fun with. And what weapons do you or you know do you use on the tour? Like, do you have a weapon? Well, I'm a nurse because I also have a brother in the tour, and the joke is that he's mom's favorite because he got to go to medical school to become a doctor, and I only got to go to nursing school. So one of my favorite things is I've got this little syringe. That's so an empty syringe. So number of people there terrified of syringes is so high. So a lot of times I'll run after them going, shot, 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 shots, scares them every time. So um, I don't really think that we have necessarily weapons that we use against each other. So you don't really have that many props, you know, to like battle with. No, a lot of it's just because whenever you're out there, like I've got my stethoscope, I've got my different things, but it's a storytelling thing. And, you know, a lot of haunt acting is storytelling. It's a lot of, you know, doing things in the moment, because especially whenever people are scared, you never know what they're going to do. And you have to play off of that. So if they're not scared, you know, keep trying to scare them is not going to work. So instead, you can make a joke with it. You know, like the number of times that I've gotten hit on in costume is way too high. And my response is always, sorry, I've got standards. And I walk away and the rest of their group thinks it's absolutely hilarious. You just kind of have to go with what's going on in the moment. And, you know, you don't really have the props or there's not things that you have to scare them. Like I scream 
super loud and I can get people with my scream if I'm in costume and if I'm out of costume and I can play off of those things that I'm naturally good at to scare people. Oh, I was just saying, I imagine it's, it's no different than, you know, we do tours and each tour we kind of have a, like a little script we work off of, but we, there's a little bit of, you know, you change things here and there, you improvise every tour. I try to like either add something or do something a little different just to kind of make it fun. So that's, that's fun that you kind of have different lines that you go to as, as someone walks through. So you can kind of work on new material, you know, as your character. So that, that's pretty cool. And I mean, sometimes you'll do something afterwards. It's like, wow, that was meaner than I meant it to be. And then it's like, I need to change that for next time. Or sometimes you'll hit on something and it was like, oh, that was good. I'm using that again. Or you'll heal somebody else using something that then you can use. Like we have one of them is Gustav. Gustav is one of our favorite characters in Netherworld. He wears a glass eye and he pops it up for people. And we have this back and forth where he tells people about the crazy redhead that's holding the door. And then if somebody, oh, are you the crazy redhead that he talks about? And then all of a sudden I just start screaming at them out of nowhere, scares them. And it's kind of a fun back and forth that we can go off of. And he was the one who said something about the crazy redhead. And it was like, oh, I can use that. And like, we constantly steal things off of each other and, the reactions that people get is really what you're there for. Yeah, and you don't want to say something too extreme where you're going to get reported or fired from your job. But, you know, you probably try to push the boundaries as much as you can. Yeah, and, you know, you kind of you learn to start recognizing the people who really don't want to be there. And those are the ones that you really have to be on the lookout for. But also, you know, that kind of does lead into a good point. Is I know a lot of you guys on the podcast probably love going to haunted houses. Please respect haunt workers. Please listen to directions that we have on the screen. You know, we have people every year that end up with broken bones and, you know, bruises and things like that from people pushing them back, you know, getting in front of something whenever they're told not to. So please be sure to respect haunt workers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, talking, talking a little bit about finding the finding the person that doesn't want to be there. I know sometimes that is my favorite person in the audience because I'm like, I want to win you over. And it's like, if I can win you over and get you to like have a good time tonight, because there's always like, I, I know for like tours and stuff, there's always like, like a reluctant family member. You know, you get like a group of four, or a family of five, and there's always a one family member that's there because they gotta be. And I'm like, nah, I'm, I want to, I want to give you a good time. Thinking to that, I, I did have a question. Like in your experience, you're talking about scaring people, and I, I am kind of after like what, what makes a good ghost story? What makes a good scary story? As someone, a haunt worker, do you have? a go-to tried and true tactic that you use to try and scare people? My scream is the biggest one. You know, whenever you're hot working, you definitely have the story in your mind, but that's not what's going to make somebody jump, right? You know, there are a few things that you can do. Like I've got this one book and, you know, I tell them, you know, oh, this is the story of the Han and this is where we keep all the information about our monsters and you start opening up and you slam it really fast and it creates that sound and it gets them. But whenever you're working, you're not really looking to draw them in with the story as much as you are to really kind of create those moments of, okay, everything's fine, everything's fine. No, it's not. So kind of that arc is the big one. But with the scary stories in general, just from being to so many haunted places, I think that Whenever you can bring in the history of a place and you can show them, you know, this is how people lived back then. This is why they felt this way. To me, that has more heart to it and more scare to it than, you know, jumping out at somebody. So I think it really depends on how you want to define scare. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I like that a lot. You know, the, I definitely, I definitely hear you when you say like loud noises, scare people like that, that one seems like, I'm like, hmm, that makes sense to me. And then like hearing you talk about kind of the, like, everything's okay. Everything's okay. Everything's not okay. Kind of the pulling the, the rug factor. out. Yeah. Like the pulling the rug out from under them, the, the, the zig to the zag as it were, that, that makes a lot of sense. So 
you know, coming back, we, we've talked about Netherworld, right? And that's that's the big one. That's like going, that's the one down in Georgia, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's in Stolen Mountain just outside of Atlanta. And that's, yeah, it, it, it's it's huge. I remember uh, in college, I had a buddy, he would go every year. It was like, like it was his dragon con. Like he was so excited every year to go. Apart uh, now, that that's obviously way like probably one of the highest things on the list. Tell us about some other like really awesome attractions. What would be what would be some of your highlights? What would you say are some of the best haunted attractions? Yeah, so I have been to four different countries and around twenty different states with different haunted things, places that I've been, and just kind of I love to travel, and that's kind of what I seek out whenever I travel. So like the next one that I'm really excited to go to is Salem, Massachusetts. So we've got a trip down there. My namesake was Samantha from Bewitch. So I'm excited to get to take a picture with the statue and, you know, see some of the different things with that. But yeah, I've been to a bunch in Colorado because I lived in Colorado for a while. If you've ever been out to the Stanley Hotel, that one's really one of my favorites. It was the hotel that The Shining was based off of in Stephen King's books. So that was a really exciting one. One of the ones that I went to that I was so excited for, but it was a little bit of a letdown, was the Loch Ness. So over in Scotland, getting to see that with the monster and everything. And what made that a letdown? Because like, I, you know, if I were to make a list of where I'd want to go, I mean, going to search for Nessie, you know, in, in Loch Ness would, would be a highlight. So and basically what I'm hearing is not to go. Why was it a disappointment? It was one of those things where I will say that I went in the off season, so that might have been it. But whenever I got down there, there wasn't really that much about the monster. And like I even booked a tour that was about the Loch Ness. So I definitely suggest going. It is an absolutely beautiful area. There is there's not really a lot around it, though. And there just wasn't that much about the monster. You know, it's a lake, you know, and. It was something that I was really looking forward to, too. It was one of the things I was looking for most about going to Scotland. And the castle has a lot of cool history to it. But there was like one statue about the monster. They had maybe one little exhibit at one of the gift shops. But there just wasn't a lot about the monster. And I think it's because blowing up the history of something, especially the paranormal history, is much more prevalent in America than what it is in other countries. Hmm. But you, but you did like get to go in the in the lake or is it, and you know to look for it or you know in a boat. So they really didn't have anything that was like going and doing a monster hunt for it. I went on the Nessie tour, but they spent maybe 15 20 minutes talking about the monster and the rest of it was about Yukart Castle and, you know, the history of the area, but there was just very little about the monster. Wow, that sounds like super lame. It was a little bit of a disappointment because that was like one of my bucket list items and then there just wasn't as much about it. But one that was really cool was the Stanley Hotel up in Colorado. And I think I have a picture of that one too here. And The Shi- Shining is one of my favorite movies, so I've always would like would like to go to that. I'm glad to hear that this is somewhere to go. I haven't been. So this was actually outside the Red Room, which if I have not read The Shining personally, I need to, I know. But this was the room that he was staying in while he was there. And one of the coolest parts about it is that it is on a magnetic nexus, right? And if you remember in The Shining movie, there's that scene where they're looking up and the staircase just looks like it keeps going up and up and up. And you can experience that in the hotel. So you stand in this one spot and it was just like, whoosh you know and it made you dizzy standing there but it was really neat so the weird thing about this one too was like this was one where i think it is an orb in this picture i'm not 100 percent certain but there was a lot of places where you could hold the camera up and you could see like all these little flickerings of light and like they look like little orbs falling but they wouldn't appear on camera and you couldn't see them with your naked eye So it was very odd and just really neat to see because it was like, it's there, you can tell it, but you can't capture it and you can't actually see it. Yeah. And that happens a lot in paranormal investigations where uh, you'll see something, you'll try to capture that evidence, but you're not actually able to capture what you're seeing or hearing in the moment and also vice versa. 
you won't see or hear something, but then later you go back and review the footage and it's there. So it's always interesting, you know, in terms of like looking for at paranormal evidence and trying to capture it, that sometimes it's elusive. And the cool thing about that one too, is that we tried talking to some of the employees about stuff they had seen there. And the majority of them would say, yes, I have experienced things here and no, I will not talk about it. So, you know, there was a lot of, you know, evidence throughout there. They had also like a haunted doll or two that was left there. And, you know, they said there's never really been a tragic death at that hotel, but it is on a magnetic nexus. And, you know, for a lot of people, that was their happiest moments in life. So they think that's what's drawn the spirits there is because they were looking for this happiness after they died. Beautiful area too. Lots of gorgeous mountains. So definitely a must do if you're into the whole paranormal. I'm going to put that on my paranormal uh, travel itinerary for sure in the next few years. You mentioned Magnetic Nexus. Can you elaborate on that? It's been a while since I've been to the hotel, honestly, so I'm not as familiar with it. But the main thing that I remember from it was that staircase because, man, you looked up and it was just like it never ended, you know, and they said it was because of the magnetic fields from the mountains and everything there. And it looked like it did in the movie. Like it was that weird looking whenever you looked up that you just kept seeing it go up and up and up. Did you see the movie Dr. Sleep? No, I have not. Are you aware of how the ending of The Shining book ends? I've seen the movie, the original movie, but I've heard that the ending was a lot different. Yeah, than, I was wondering if you knew book. how the book ended because I didn't want to spoil it if you didn't know. I mean, I will probably forget. So well, it, go it's ahead also and... the ending of Dr. Sleep. So I'm actually not going to spoil it for, for our listeners or for you. But it's just it's it's an interesting I was going to talk about you know how the book ended and how but the movie is one of my favorites i've never read the book either i just am aware of how it ended and that's how dr sleep ends for those who are listening who don't know this the book is so much different than the movie and the movie is one of the best horror movies ever made stanley kubrick made it but he like deliberately changed so much whereas stephen king hates the the movie and stephen king obviously one of the best horror authors of all time you know so you have one of the best horror books and one of the best horror movies yet they're so different from each other and some of the changes that stanley kubrick made are so weird and there's actually a documentary out there called i think it's room 237 and you know it goes into a lot of these i guess conspiracy theories and different things one of which is that the evidence for that the moon landing was faked and that stanley kubrick filmed it is in the movie the shining so you can actually watch that as well as a lot of like there's five stories so for those out there listening definitely check out room 237 i'm very interested in the shining movie the shining book all that kind of stuff and, and apologies to you if you know all that i just for the listeners out there listening things to things to look at you know read the shining watch the movie watch dr sleep read the book and check out room 237 he come out with a limited series too where stephen king presents the shining and that's supposed to be very close. To right. And I actually forgot so about that. They did read. Yeah, I actually forgot about that. And I've never seen it. I, I should maybe check it. I haven't seen it either, but I heard like that is the that is the one that he wanted. Yeah. To I've also made. never read the book, so I should read it. I, you know, oh, I love watching his movies, but his writing is just not my cup of tea. And I just have a harder time getting through his books with that because like it's an amazing storyline. It's just I just can't get into his writing right there's only so much time that i have to read and i kind of you know like to read a lot of paranormal nonfiction. and so when it's fictional it kind of turns me off a little bit but i, I should get around to at least reading the shining <laughs> no we have a lot of it. other places i'm looking at the list on here there's one that i saw that says yeah we had like a highlight we had a we had like the one star review we had like a five star review it gave you were you were saying there's one that says SC Grave. Is that South Carolina? Yeah, I couldn't remember where it was somewhere in South Carolina. It was a very cool grave because our car stopped at it, but I couldn't tell you who it was. So that was the reason why I was just listing it out. I could definitely talk about like my favorite actual ghost tour if that's something that you guys want. Well, sure, me I'd to. love for you to talk about Greenville Ghost Tours. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I think Edinburgh had to beat you okay. out. Well, yeah, tell us about Edinburgh. Ah. <laughs> yeah, so Edinburgh was probably one of my favorite ghost tours um, because they actually took you into underground Edinburgh. So if you're familiar with like a lot of European history, um, a lot of times they would build a city and then they would build uh, places underneath it where the poor were supposed to live. 
So originally in Edinburgh, they wanted this underground area to be a craftsmanship place. So like people, you know, having their leather working shop because like you don't need windows to do that type of thing. Well, the thing about it was they found out that once they built it, it flooded. So none of the craftsmen wanted to be down there because, you know, they were ankle deep in water. So like the poorest of the poor end up living down there. And you go down there and there's no light whatsoever. Um, you know, these were families that were 12, 13 people in the family stuck into a tiny, you know, one bedroom apartment room. And, um, you know, there was a lot of deaths down there. So um, I actually kind of have a cool picture here of me getting whipped. So this was one at the top of it. And it was so funny because... They were talking about, you know, how they would whip people publicly in the square to, you know, if they did something wrong or something. So she brought out the whip and they're like, does anybody want to get whipped? And I'm like, of course I do. So I volunteered and got kind of pushed up against the wall and like had my crimes read out to me. And then they were using the whip on all of us. And then they took you down there and I wish there was better pictures. But whenever I say there was no light, there was absolutely no light in there. And, you know... Like I said, it was just these very bad conditions. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting from a historical standpoint was the idea of the drunk Irishman or Scottish. And the reason for that was that beer was cheaper to bring into the city than clean water. So if you were poor, you were just drunk all the time. So, you know, that was kind of one of the stories. And I actually did have a little bit of a something happened on that one because we were down there and I work a lot with kids. I do a lot of princess cosplay and things along those lines. And um, as we were going through, there was this one room and there was this hole in the ground. There was holes in the ground everywhere. And I looked at it and I told my buddy and I was like, there's something in there. And, you know, he was like, oh, you know, you're just on the tour. And I'm like, no, like I, there's something there. And I couldn't figure out exactly what it was. And then whenever she got to explaining it right afterwards, it was a ghost that only appeared to um, children or people who work with children a lot. So, you know, I definitely think that there was somebody in that hole, but, you know, it was just kind of the corner of my eye kind of thing. But that tour was absolutely phenomenal. What was the, what was the story about? So they haven't actually been able to figure it out. She had been running this tour for several years. And the reason why she got turned on to it was that there was apparently this one family that booked a tour and they didn't realize that it was a ghost tour. And so they had like this little six-year-old kid on this tour who's terrified because, you know, he's a six-year-old kid. And so like the whole time he was like crying and different things like that. And they got into this room and he started laughing and he started talking to somebody who wasn't actually there. So and then like throughout the time that she had been there, she had, you know, seen teachers that had like saw a kid in there or something. There was other children that reported seeing somebody that was over in there. So they've done a lot of research. But because this was the poorest of the poor that lived there, there's not a lot of records of the actual families who lived down in there. So she believes that, you know, it was just the spirit of a child who died. And, you know, there's another room before that where a lot of the kids who like started crying harder. In. So they don't know if like maybe the two are connected or anything like that. But unfortunately, there's just not a lot of records of who this child was. So they're thinking it's some sort of spirit of a child though that presents itself to other children or people who I like identify as like guardians of like children in some capacity. It seems exactly. Like. Yeah. And I mean, like I've had a lot of experiences with child spirits through different things because, you know, I do teach and I do a lot of princess cosplay and things like that. So a lot of times I can kind of get them to be a bit more active. So I think that was the reason why I saw something. And what would you say some of the one. signs are that you're dealing with a child spirit as opposed to an adult spirit or, you know, a non-human spirit? I don't really know the difference, to be honest with you. I think they're just a little bit more drawn to me. There was one that I went to, and it was with Southern Ghost Girls. It was a, a public investigation that they were doing down at the Jasper Jail in Georgia. So the Jasper Jail in Georgia, you know, it's a lot of history of they actually built the jail next to the schoolhouse and those things just don't really mix you know surprise surprise 
So one of my best stories about that one was that I've kind of learned that if you are dealing with ghost spirits and actually did this on the Greenville tour, ring around the rosy, you know, ring around the rosy is something that's been around for years and years and years. So if you can get them to play that with you, you can see like, for example, whenever we on the Greenville ghost tour, they had the, what were those balls called again? The cat, cat balls? The cat balls. Yeah. So like I started singing it and you could see the cat balls going in the same pace as Ring Around the Rosie. So I was at the Jasper Jail and they were, we were in the schoolhouse, which is known to be haunted by several children. There was a, some sort of, I think it was a fever that broke out there at one point. And so they had the rods and so we were sitting there and I started singing Ring Around the Rosie and they were very active going around and around. So it's just something that I've kind of picked up from going to different places. And, you know, I feel like, that you know, I can also tell them, hey, I'm a teacher. I work with kids just like you and treat them as I would real kids. And they seem to, in a lot of cases, like Yeah, that's that. a, a great point. Like singing childhood songs and ringing the, run the rosy in particular in a cemetery or wherever a child spirit may be is a good way to uh, try to get some interaction. And that's really cool. You mentioned you came on a Greenville Ghost Tour and you uh, got some evidence, got some cat balls to kind of be in coordination with, with the singing. Yeah, it was a neat experience. It really was. Because I mean, like we got like most of the time too, I think if you get the entire tour to start singing it, then it's like, you know, oh, everybody's playing with me. Yay. And it's just something that kind of works really well on these kind of tours. The, I'm going to keep that one in the back pocket. I, I have a tour this Saturday. Maybe I have to give that a shot when we get to yeah. the cemetery. And we did a spirit box session. I think yeah. if I remember correctly, that the tour you were on was pretty active but I don't quite remember. I don't know if you were Yeah, there. we got Mike, and then we had not Mike. So I'm, we weren't really sure about that one through the spirit box. But yeah, there was definitely some things going on with that. Well, a lot of spirits can be playful. It's possible it was Mike saying he's not Mike, because I don't know, that's some of the humor that you get out of these spirits. Well, I mean, I've worked at another world. I like scaring people, so I'm sure I'd like to do that after death, too, so... <laughs> no doubt. Let's see. Uh, you mentioned you went to New Orleans and that you did some some voodoo stuff there. Um, not really as much voodoo. We did do a couple of the tours. Um, I do have my friend here, Missy. She was one of my little things that we picked up over there, and she's kind of become like our friend. And she is completely the one opening up the cabinets because it's definitely not me and leaving them open. Not at all. You know, but she's kind of become like our jokester and we play around with her and, you know, it's me opening the cabinets, but I blame it on her and we kind of have a little joke about her in the house. So she's kind of become- How'd you acquire friend. Missy? There's a bunch of artists that make these kind of cool voodoo arts around there that you can kind of go up to. You know, one of the things I loved about New Orleans is that a lot of the fortune telling and things like that, it was just on street corners. So it wasn't like you had to seek it out. It was absolutely everywhere, which was really neat. So she was just being sold. She was being sold by the Mississippi, which is why we call her Missy. And she's just kind of become our good luck charm since we got her. But if you haven't been to New Orleans, New Orleans is absolutely phenomenal for the paranormal stuff. Are you guys familiar with like their burial practices at all down in New yes, Orleans? Yes, I have been, and it's great. I've a little I've been bit, to the, yeah. You know, St. Louis one, St. Louis two. You know the different cemeteries, and in, 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 a lot of it's above ground. Everything's yeah, above yeah. ground, right? Yeah, they're all above ground. I was just saying the disappointing thing is that they close the cemeteries at night, and it's always like when I'm there is at nighttime. I was there during the day and got to a room around. So they of do have one of the tours now that goes into the um, cemeteries at night. So like whenever we went, we did one of the tours and it was really interesting because like you said, you know, the, everything's at sea level. So they showed us where you can take a flashlight in the cemeteries and see bits of people's noses and bones sticking up right. from the ground if you just shine the flashlight on it at night. So that was something that was really interesting because with their tombs and the story just absolutely floors me and I love it so much is that you have a family tomb, right? Well, if, and then they'll put you in the tomb, they'll let you decompose 
for a year and then they'll either come in and like shove your bones down into the tomb or they'll take you out and like your burial sheet and just kind of flux it because you can only fit so many people in the tombs at a time. So they said, you know, it was nothing to come out and you would just see a body being flung open in the middle of the cemetery during the week. And then what I loved about it was that if you go look at the tombs, there's a lot of names scratched out. And that was because family members didn't want that family member to be included on the tomb because, you know, they didn't like them or they didn't feel like they were true family or whatever. So the amount of drama that goes into these is just so phenomenal. And I love it. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's, I love that. I would. Sometimes I, I look at like Springwood's absolutely amazing and it has like a couple buildings like that, but like to see everything above ground like that and to, to be able to hear some of those stories, that that's really, really cool. Well, hey, Sam, we're, we're starting to get towards the end of our time here. Did you have any other stories? Do you have any other adventures that you'd want to share of all your paranormal adventure, all your paranormal attractions that you've been to? Oh, gosh, there's a lot of really cool ones. But one of the best advice that I can give you is that no matter where you're at, just ask whoever's working there if they've had any experiences. One of the cool ones that I got to hear about was me and my boyfriend took a cruise down to Mexico. We went on one of the cruise things to the Mayan ruins. And I asked the tour guide, you know, the tour had nothing to do with anything that was supernatural or anything like that. And uh, I was like, hey, have you just had any cool experiences with the paranormal around, you know, these ruins? And he was like, yeah, we have the axolotls. And that was a, something that I had never heard of before. And I got talking to him about it. And apparently there are old Mayan spirits that are tricksters. And he was like, all the people working there know we have to leave little treats for them out. Because if not, you'll be in the middle of the night and all of a sudden somebody will start throwing rocks at you or you'll start tripping everywhere and everything. And that was a story that's not well put out there, but talking to him about it was absolutely phenomenal. And it was just because I asked. Uh, awesome. Which uh, leads me to want to ask you, have you had any uh, paranormal experiences? So probably the craziest paranormal experience I had was in Gettysburg. If you're familiar with Gettysburg, it is one of the biggest battles in the Civil War. It was one of the first battles. And I was a dumb eighth grader whenever I went there. And I want to preface the story with this is not something to do. But there's this old story and there's a Sergeant Langley, which is my last name. So I was really interested in it. And what, back in the day, whenever they had pictures of battle... They would take pictures of dead bodies because if you're going to take a picture, you had to sit still for so long and you couldn't ask the soldier to sit still in the middle of battle. So they would take pictures of dead bodies. Well, this one guy, he was Sergeant Langley, and the journalist went in, he took a picture of him. Well, six months after the battle, he was doing a follow-up article. He goes back out to there to that same spot. No one had ever buried that sergeant. And so they buried him there. And if your camera is going to mess up anywhere at all, it's going to be in that spot. So there's like this gorge right by there, just filled with like camera pieces and cell phone cameras. And they're like, you know, people back in the day, their film would be all messed up from taking photos there. So I was accidentally standing on his grave and I didn't realize it. And my teacher gave me some crap about it. So I decided to dig my foot into the grave. Again, dumb teenager. So I left there and we went to a restaurant afterwards. And my mom absolutely does not believe in this kind of stuff. Like she just does not believe it's a whole thing. And we're walking to the restaurant and all of a sudden it was like, wow, it's really cold all of a sudden. And there was a line of cars. All of the cars went off at once, like their alarms did. So it freaks us all out because, you know, we weren't expecting this. We go run up to the restaurant. Everybody's looking around, you know, turning off their car alarms, trying to figure out what's going on. And we're like, okay, that was weird. So we're like, maybe there's a vent or something up there. So we go back up to that same spot. We're looking around trying to figure out why it was so cold. And it happens again. So we all like take off running to the restaurant. We're like, nope, you know, we just need to drop it there and everything. But yeah, I'm pretty sure I, I made him pretty angry and you know, I still feel a little guilty about that. Very interesting. Day. And uh, all car alarms going off at the same time. And, you know, I believe ghosts are energy. And I think that that would seems like, you know, a, a spirit kind of setting them off all at once. And I, I can't think of a reason that 
a whole bunch of cars would have car alarms go off at one time. So that seems to be definitely a paranormal event. I don't know how your mother would explain s- such an occurrence. She even admits she can't explain right. that one. So sounds paranormal and, and it happened more than once. So that's actually repeatable. So that seems like really good evidence. Actually, some of the best evidence that I've heard lately for some, some paranormal occurrences. Uh, so that's, thanks for sharing that story. That's my favorite. Um, no problem. Fantastic. Sam, if people want if people want to come see you perform, if people want to see your cosplay online, do you have do you have any do you have any social channels you'd like to plug? Do you have any? That not you would like really, to plug? because most of mine is kids stuff, so I'd rather not mix the two worlds kind of thing. You know, for me, Absolutely. this is not a like. I, of course, I do another world, you know, and that's money coming in. But for me, it's not really a business, and it's it's one of those where I think if I ever got into it too seriously, you know, anytime you're running a business, it kills the joy in it a little bit because you've got Absolutely. to keep up with everything. And for me, it's just fun, you know, whenever I love to travel, I love the history portion of it. You know, like I said, for me, the ghost tours are as much about the paranormal as it is to hear about how people lived at certain times like the philadelphia they've got was yeah it's philadelphia they have one it's a ghost sex and vampires tour phenomenal tour and you know a lot of it is just talking about how promiscuous the founding fathers were and some of the stories that have come out of like the things that they did you know and to me ghost stories ghost stories and the paranormal they bring light to parts of history that we awesome. forget. yeah ghost sex and vampires two of my favorite things I do happen to see your <laughs> necklace. Does it happen to have any metaphysical properties? Uh, it's a mood stone. I think I got it at like Spirit Halloween. So worked for Spirit Halloween for a while. So that was really fun. But yeah, there's nothing too much. But it is cute and I like it. So Very cool. You mentioned, you, you teased that you were really good at screaming. Do you, could we get one? Oh, God. Okay, and I, it's and actually, season, uh, the so, truth is paranormal. Um, Be a searcher. And we're going to get taken out of this podcast with a scream from Sam. That's it. That's all we got for today's episode. Thank you for joining us. Please like and subscribe. And don't forget to follow us on social media at Truth Searchers. See you next time.